Okay, so in this video, I'm going to take you from the very beginning when we're going to differentiate correlation and causation. It's a cause and effect versus correlation. I'm going to basically go through and outlay the, the issues that we're dealing with when we're trying to peel these two things apart. And excitingly, I'm going to take you actually all the way, all the way to the forefront of what I see this research and where I'm most excited and where actually my personal research is uh, you know, currently being developed and bring you to the forefront of all this. So this is super exciting. You're going to get the whole scope. I do not expect you, there's zero expectation that you will be able to actually recreate any of these type of uh, designs as you did before in the last chapter, we did, uh, you did regressions, you know, that's expected. I would expect you to be able to do that. I do not expect you to do any of these methodologies. If I were going to actually train you to do that, it would take us probably a whole semester to get us going, uh, just to get us maybe one or two. And the field is very broad. So we could spend literally years and years on this. I've spent years and years on this and it's super exciting. So Without further ado, let's introduce correlation and causation. I've, I've given you this reading. It's a blog and it just kind of hits the main points. So I'm going to start there. Uh, the big thing that you need to understand is that correlation is not causation. So to see that, uh, here's a nice little diagram. So if we had a variable, say, eating ice cream and we could figure out how many gallons of ice cream, that was a variable that we measured. And we had that over days. And at the same time, we say had a variable of sunburned that measured or proxied the amount of sunburns. You could call this maybe, um, I don't know, what proxy sunburns? Well, well if you were going to measure some, how could you measure that in a real way? Um, obviously, you're not going to walk around asking people to take their shirt off. That would be kind of weird. So what would you do? I mean, probably maybe just track, I don't know sunburn treatment sales. So if you had sunburn treatment sales and you had ice cream sales over time, you could sort of start to get an idea of a relationship that there is in fact probably a relationship between the two. And uh, the, the the thing is, is, you know, correlation, these are correlations. So, you know, obviously we do not think that eating ice cream causes sunburns. But if we set up our, uh, you know, set up a regression, you might see a very strong linear correlation between these two things and say, okay, well, we see the strong linear correlation. So therefore, I mean, you would expect it to be a positive correlation. And therefore, you know, because you expect higher ice cream sales during uh, the same time when people are getting sunburns, so you might fallaciously conclude that eating ice cream causes sunburns and hey, you don't wanna do that. Uh, this kind of issue is gonna be talked about throughout this particular um, little blog. You can skip the bit on hypothesis testing that's in there extraneous, uh, but eventually you are going to want to spend some time on AB experimentation. That's a very common uh, way that they're going to get over all this issue. Now, the big issue <clears throat> behind the reason why we have problems with all this is because we have these unknown factors. These, there's maybe some unknown factor. This is called an omitted variable. Maybe an admitted variable that's causing both higher um, retention in this case and uh, joining communities. This, uh, this is a different graph. <laughs> uh, so different kind of real case study here. Uh, and there's these unknown factors. Now, the unknown factor in our previous case, if we just had data on ice cream and, and sunburn cream, would be perhaps we weren't measuring sunny weather. You know, so days of sunshine wasn't accounted for. Actually, there are quite a few, you might think, well, we'll just throw that in sunny weather and we'll be done. Actually, no, because there are quite a few other types of confounders that you might maybe consider that could like cause also what they call spurious correlations. Spurious correlations being correlations that actually make them look like there's some causal thing, but there's really not. There's some un unknown factor driving the correlation between the two that makes them spurious. One big, big, big factor is actually time itself. So if I have two variables that show upward trends over time and I regress one on the other, I will find a very strong positive correlation. But, hey, these are maybe just driven because all these things are growing over time. Things get bigger over time in general, and especially in economics, you hope so. And in fact, this is a problem that we see a lot of times in macroeconomics. 
spurious correlations driven by time. I'll show you how to overcome that when we get to the macro section. That's outside the scope here. But for right now, just sit back, relax, because I'm going to show you the way that this is typically done. Now, the way that you're getting to your book. Okay, let's take a survey of your book. I will put this in context for you. Okay, so in your book, but da, 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 we are talking about this within the context of estimating price responses. Okay, think about what a price response is. It's how much the quantity changes when we change our price, right? How much does the quantity of demand actually change or respond when we change our price? This type of question is a causal question. What's the cause effect? What is the effect of a price change on quantity? You see, we've done this so far in regression and regression can get you actually a decent amount of way there. This, I'm not saying everything we've done is totally, you know, not worthy of, of, uh, of things because actually a lot of my research, I start off by just looking at correlations and correlations give you a lot of insights. Okay. And, and there's, and there's another paper I've given you about how to kind of weigh correlations in making business decisions. And basically you got to consider, you know, what's the, what's the do a cost benefit. If I, you know, if I make this choice, does it have a big cost? You know, if it's very costly, if, if, if I make the wrong choice, if that's very costly, then I better be pretty precise and really roll up my sleeves and do a more robust estimation to make sure I'm making the right choice. Right. If it's kind of, Maybe, you know, you just have to think about it in the business context of the decision that you're actually making to know exactly if it's appropriate to dig in and how far you should dig in and what you should actually be doing. Um, but now we're getting to the point and we're at, well, I'm just putting this in context where chapter four fits in is this is the digging in. This is if you've determined that, hey, this is an important thing we need to be very precise about. We can't make mistakes here. We got to nail this down. We got to be sure that we're right. And uh, we got to hit it right on the head fleshly. And if you really want to know cause effect, then this is the chapter that's going to lay it out for you. Now, they talk about, um, so now hopefully you should know, um, okay, there's things that maybe something emitted that causes, uh, that caused, you know, some kind of emitted variable that causes, uh, you know, some kind of a response. There could be seasonality. There could be some kind of ticket sale that's going on somewhere else, some complementary good, some substitute good that has some movement in it, some local event, some local types of uh, general factors in the economy. Maybe there's COVID-19 that struck and that just like caused a huge thing. There could be all kinds of different omitted factors that can drive correlations, okay? And that's the point is that the list is just huge and you're really, it's not, um, you know, you could try to consider all these and control for all these, okay, fine. Um, but what they're saying in your book, and I'm going to disagree with them here and I'm going to make a lot of people upset, but in 4.1.1, they call the randomized trial, the randomized testing is randomized, you know, this randomized uh, experiment, randomized trials or experimental. This is a classical experimental design. So they're saying that this is the gold standard. I'm going to say hogwash. I'm going to say that's what we used to think the gold standard is, but not anymore. And I'm going to make that argument by the end of this. And that's where I'm excited. But we're not there yet. So uh, let's talk about what is a randomized trial and why is that actually something that we might want to do uh, to get us a little teaser. Um, I'm going to say actually that, um, well, let's just get into it. I'll come back. Okay. Randomized trial. So let's think this is the mathematical types of, uh, if you want to actually know the mathematical notations about treatment effects, uh, we actually look at, um, this is an expectation operator. So what do we think it's going to be? Uh, and, and, and the why is our outcome variable in this case, it's going to be quantity. X is going to be a price. Actually, X is on this side of the equation, quantity and X. You see that how it's set up? Then, which is that bar right there, that the unit was treated. And this is the expectation of a treated outcome. So this is actually what we see. You see, um, this is what's going to be called the counterfactual. Okay. So this is the expectation. Look, read this. The expectation of a treated person. Okay. This is the outcome of this is the expectation of the outcome of a treated person given some factors that we're going to control for and given that they never received treatment. Think about that. That is the kicker. This thing right here. 
is the thing that we are confronted with trying to estimate and trying to form a, a proper expectation about. It's the, I'll say it clearly, it's the expectation of a treated person given that they never received treatment. How do you do that? How do you do that? Okay. That is kind of crazy because we, we never get to see it. You either got the treatment and if you got the treatment and the data then we can look at your outcome, right? Or you didn't get the treatment. If you didn't get the treatment, we can look at your outcome. But this is the expectation of a treated person had they never been treated. So this is how we think of treatment effects. It's, it's the outcome of the treated person that got treated minus what we think the outcome would have been if they never got treated. And that difference is the effect. Okay. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to estimate. And the whole estimation strategy is going to be pinned down to how do we account for this one particular right hand side part of that equation. The whole thing is pinned down to how do we account for that? There's a lot of schemes. And every time you go look in your book and you look at these different schemes, so we have A-B testing. When you read A-B testing, you're doing basically like a type of randomized type of controlled experiment where you're basically just giving some people a treatment and some people not a treatment. The classical way that we do uh, estimation and the way that they say is the gold standard is these randomized testings Think about classical experiments. What do you do in a classical experiment? Well, what do you do? Okay, look, real simple. You take, you randomly select people into two groups, either, either a, a treatment group or a control. Okay, so you have two groups. Important that you get random assignment for, for, for this. So you're going to randomly pull out of the population a person and plop it in this group okay randomly pull all the population pull them in that group just keep repeating the process take random these random draws and create these random groups okay and you can do this on websites by trying to you know randomize how you pull people off and whether they get treated or not uh so you're, you're pulling off these different groups okay every dots a person that's kind of what i'm trying to imply here so you pull them off in different groups you randomly assign them into either a treated or control group. You don't tell them if they're in a treated or control group, obviously. Um, that's a single blind. And double blind would be the person doing the thing doesn't know either. Uh, that's double blind. But, you know, you don't want them to know or else there could be some biases, right, that you're introducing. You're going to assign them into a group. And then you're going to give the treated group the, the treatment effect. Okay? So so you're going to, you're going to, you're going to give this group the treatment. That, but be it an aspirin, be it a, you know, it's a drug trial, be it, it's an advertising trial. So, in, you know, in a website, maybe you want to see how an advertisement works. You're going to give this group the advertisement and the control group, the controlled group, this is a dummy variable, is not going to get it. Okay. And then what you do is you're going to estimate this expectation of this outcome Okay, this you're gonna basically just just measure the expectations of outcomes. That's what you're doing, which means that you're going to estimate. In some cases, uh, the typical way is we look at the average. So let's look at just just this average y. This average. This is y stands for an an outcome. Okay, we can look at that average outcome of a control group. And then you can just subtract the two and come out with what's called an average treatment of the treated, ATT. Or some people call this an average treatment effect. An average treatment effect. Why? Because you're looking at the average outcome of the treated group and comparing it to the average outcome of the control group. Okay. That's how this is typically done. Okay. And, and that's, that's the classical type of experimental setting. Okay. That's what we get. Okay. So I want you to think though, now real carefully about a more idealized, like, like, what are we missing here? Okay. Think about this. Oh, shoot. I'm just gonna, I need to swap these one second. I need to swap. How do I swap? 
Oh boy, I kind of forgot how to swap this. I'm so sorry. Hide presenter view. How about that? How about we hide presenter view? No, and I don't want it there. Mm. I need to swap. How do I swap? Oh boy. One second, folks. I'm sorry for this technical glitch. Screen. Pointer options. Subtitle settings. Camera. Next. Previous. Oh, jeez. I forgot. I, I've done this before. PowerPoint. You're not my friend. Okay. Okay. Forget it. I, this is we're, we're just going to scrap the PowerPoint. Uh, nice presentation, and I'm going to give it to you this way. Okay. Look. Actually, I want you to consider that the way we do classical experiments is actually not quite ideal, because in an ideal world. Okay, in an idealized kind of experiment, if we could do anything possible, if we had every single tool possible to our disposal, what we would want is a time machine. Of course, that's not possible, but that's what we would want, right? So what we'd want to do is we'd want to say, you know, give us some, basically take some people, right? We give, we, we say, I'm calling the outcome their height. We can measure their heights. You could give them this uh, drug that's supposed to make them get taller and measure their heights afterwards. Of course, why can't you just compare the heights between these two things? Why? Because other things could be confounding that, right? They could grow. There could be some you know, toxic release of growth hormone cloud that like swept through the sky and dumped it on everyone's head. It has nothing to do with the drug, et cetera, et cetera. So there's kind of those confounders. So we need an experiment, right? So, you know, but what you're going to do is measure their heights before you're going to give them this, uh, this drug measure their heights afterwards, right? And then in an ideal world, you'd hop in your little fancy time machine and you travel back in time to the time when you didn't give them the drug and you wouldn't give them the drug. You already knew their heights before. And then you'd wait after, you'd wait the same amount of time and you'd measure their heights later on, right? And then the treatment effect of the drug is actually the difference of the heights of these two bottom groups. You can see that actually without the drug, they still grew over time, but maybe they grew over time more with the drug. And because you had a time machine, you could know exactly how each individual was supposed to grow without the drug and compare it individually with every person in the presence of the drug. Okay. And this is kind of the cool thing. This is where my work comes in because instead of average effects, guess what I guess what my work does? My work basically tries to estimate these individual hypotheticals. So what's the effect or what is the what would the what would the individual look like had they never been exposed to this particular kinds of treatment? That's where my work resides. Your textbook here is still stuck in the world of averages. That's where almost I mean so I've been talking about this for a while. I can't find anybody who's actually doing what I'm doing. This is a world of averages. The entire world that we live in is a world of statistical averages. My work is different because I'm looking at individuals. Okay. I'm looking at individuals. And so what I look at is actually what's called individual effects. That's pretty cool, right? So individual effects, I'll just show you. Um, I build, I build a causal time machine. A time machine is uh, this is this is actually my research. I build these causal time machines. I, you can go into these. Uh, they're very model agnostic. I use machine learning, artificial intelligence to build these models. And in this case, I looked at. Um, I'll just show you my research a little bit. Is I looked at the uh, U.S.-China trade war, and, on and the individual in this case was actually a product class. So we import a ton of products, you know, internationally, and they are classified by this HS categorization. Uh, and there's a number of digits. When you get into, this is, count them, there's six digits here. You actually have a very detailed type of product. So that's a very detailed kind of level. There's 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 a lot of them throughout the economy, literally thousands. And to get these, all these different products. And I'm looking at, instead of just looking at the effect of the trade war in general for you know everybody, which would be like this average type treatment effect, what I'm looking at is I can look at the effect on a very specific individual product here. Okay. So what I find is actually that there's quite a bit of differences here. You can see 
that I've got the actual imports from China. These are US imports of these cultivators. And that's the red is the actual import. And I've recreated a predicted import. You see the green, the prediction. You see that the April announcement is when we announced that we're going to be tariffing this product. So we announced on in April, hey, we're going to tariff this product. I'm counting that as my treatment start period. And interestingly enough, what I can see is I can not only see, I, I can see in it, I can see the, the actual individual effects, which is something that your book, all the things in there can't do, uh, no matter how hard they try, they can't do it. Um, I'll give you the effect on the individual and very cool. Check this out. Effect on the individual. And on top of that, I can see how that effect sort of evolves over time, which is something a lot of these actually can do a little bit, some better than others, some not at all. This does evolution over time at the individual level. That's awesome, isn't it? So cool. So like for these uh, cultivators, what I see is that this Trump, this, well, like I was going to slip a tongue. It's actually not a Trump uh, tariff war or trade war. You notice that it's still going on after he left office. That's a whole different study in economics, but actually there's bipartisan support for this uh, trade war for a lot of different reasons that we're not going to dive into right now. But uh it's actually just a general trade war, the U.S.-China trade war. Um, and so the April announcement was announced. And what we see is what? The actual imports were higher than predicted. Okay, means actually that, that and, and, I'm, and look, so, so the, the, there was an announcement and then the tariff became effective. What we see is that there was a, sort of a stocking up. This is what I would call a stock up prior to, you know, there's an announcement, you see that the higher prices are coming. So what do you do? You stock up. That's actually a common like theory. We see that here. There's a stocking up. And then after, sometime after the, the actually the tariffs became effective, uh, it kind of went back to what were kind of normal levels. So actually in this case, the tariff actually just caused a brief sort of swell in imports of cultivators. Interesting. Okay. Um, Sometimes there's a lot of noise in this prediction, not a good prediction, predictive model. I'm still working on some of that. In this case, we see actual imports take a big dip right at the announcement and then kind of come back up a little bit. But in general, you know, that big dip, you know, that was that, this was a product, this uh, polymers where uh, where the, the, the war actually was uh, was hurting China. Right. Because actual imports dropped well below the predicted values means that there was actually a negative effect of the of the war on polymers against china so my whole point and the thing that i really just so excited about is think about this when i get these individual effects if you looked at the very beginning what did you see my favorite policy analysis is the optometrist why because let me ask you a question if i'm so uh, basically any doctors go right to anything they're they're you know, they're, they're giving out these policies. Policy is just like, you know, a prescription. A trade war tariff is a prescription. You know, raising your uh, prices or changing your prices or your marketing or anything, those are prescriptions or we can call them policies, I'm going to call them. Okay, so think about this. An optometrist, you walk into the office, you say, hey, I'd like a pair of glasses. He says, okay, I got a glass for you. I'm going to give you a pair of glasses. Oops. I got telemarketers calling me. A pair of glasses cut for down here, up here in the corner, the average person. We know that the effect of these glasses has on average a good effect. Here's your glasses. How happy are you? Probably not happy. If I give you a prescription for the glasses for the average person, most people are not going to be happy. And here's the kicker. Most people are not average. Most people are not average. Think about that. But these textbooks and everything we do is based on average treatment effects. You can't find what I'm talking about here in any book. It's not there. I'm writing the book on this. Okay. So the cool thing is I like the optometrist. What does the optometrist do? He puts these he puts, I should learn the name for these things. These are such cool devices. Puts them on your eyes, right? And he does a little experiment. 
sort of like we did with a, with a trade war. You do a policy change. That's what he's doing with these glasses. So the trade war, you might change the tariffs a little bit. In this case, they, they flip the, the corrective lens to a certain number, and then they do a test. In my case, I would estimate the treatment effect. And then they do a test and they say, does it make it better or worse? And you go, okay, well, it makes it a little better. So then he flips it to another one, does another test. Does it make it better or worse? And you kind of iteratively go through the series of treatment testing, effect testing, treatment effect testing, treatment effect testing, until you pin down the precise pair of glasses for the right person. And what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of policy for trade wars? It means that we don't tar we don't tariff products where it hurts us, where it actually increases imports. We tariff products where it hurts. If you're going to do a trade war, why are so so the the policy of the trade war was based on average treatment effects and I'll tell you what, we came across the board with this 20% tariff this bam across the board we're going to just, they give a big list. They all get bumped up by a flat amount. That's what you get. Average treatment effects lead to average policy making. Okay. Average policy making because they're the normal part. Most people are not average. Average policy making is wrong most of the time. It's right on average. Okay. For the average person. Now, who is that average person? Okay. What segment does that average person belong to? Are we alienating the very most important segments with our average policies? Those are all hazards that we're not addressing with the current methodologies in this book and the current methodologies that you get everywhere else. We are being blind to those things. And so we're charging ahead, making all these average type of things and, and actually average policies. And on one side, think about it. On one side, maybe the policy was too weak. And on the other side, the policy was too strong. It's like the three little bears, right? But that one policy was just right. We got to find that policy. That's what I'm going to preach, okay? I'm, I'm off my pulpit. Um, I could not in good like faith, though, just like send you off into these textbook. And especially just, you know, this is an area I'm clearly very passionate about and working on without just giving you some exposure to individual effects. So individual treatment effects is something that you will, you, you can Google search it. And you will find uh, lots of papers on it, but beware, they are not actually individual treatment effects. I will get to this slide. Look, many individual treatment effect models are actually Kate models or conditional average effect models. Conditional means the treatment effect conditional on say like gender. So you can look, basically you can do different tests and split different treatment groups up conditionally on different subgroups and look at those, but you're still doing conditional effects. You're not doing average effects. What I've got is the secret sauce. So there you go. Um, hope you enjoyed it. It's something uh, something I hope to continue to work on. I, I, it's, it's a little tough being, uh, you know, teaching and doing research. Obviously, I'm not going to whine about it. But um, yeah, there's so many things that I wish I could do with my life. This is one of the things that I feel like I have to do and have to continue because I feel like this type of uh, research is just so uh, potentially groundbreaking in how we look at the world and making decisions. Okay. And that's what makes me so excited about it. Now, as far as uh, pricing and revenue optimization goes, okay, there, I, what I want you to do, I'm going to give this a little bit of just help you to look through this. There's AB testing, AB testing. Uh, you should read it. Think about it. Every time you think about any of these experimental designs, you just need to think about how are they recreating the counterfactual? How are they creating the? Uh, how do they? How do they? How are they estimating the effect of this? You know, treated unit. Had they never been treated? And hopefully by now, I went through this long explanation, but hopefully by now, you understand that in classical experiments, what is this term? This is the control group. Okay, the control group. It's the people who didn't get the treatment. That's the control group. There's your treatment group. There's your control group. Okay. There's a lot of different ways that that they that they that they've that come up to be very creative, and actually how to try to estimate these control groups. There's discontinuity types of designs. There's difference and differences. They show you and, and difference and differences. 
basically you look at there's a group that gets the treatment there's a group that doesn't there's a treatment there's a control group and you look at the difference between the groups and over time and the assumption there is that these differences don't change over time and that they have some types of tests that can try to test for all that that's this is like a, a scheme you know this is a way that they've tried to scheme up uh how to recreate classical experimental designs. Again, you'll get average treatment effects here with difference and differences and these parallel trend assumptions. Guess what? They might look like they hold, but that doesn't mean they actually hold during the test period. You can't test for that. Every one of these has uh, Achilles heels and we can go into all of these. I'm not going to hold you to, uh, I'm not going to actually hold you to understand all of these. Okay. Um, what I will hold you to do is understand a couple other things, and I will make those points very clear, actually, in another video. Uh, you won't actually have to estimate or do anything uh, besides understand the high-level points of causal analysis and understand that there's different types of schemes. And if you're interested and you're really curious by this by now, I'm happy to give you more resources. I've tried to give you a resource in this book that allows you to kind of continue on and dive, go further. So I'm trying to give you a resource that, you know, you can, you can kind of see how this fits in. The big thing you need to understand is how this fits into revenue optimization. You don't need to know exactly how to do it unless you really want to. If you're like me and you just find it curious and interesting and you want to dive in, please, by all means, keep going. Appendix B has some of the mathematical notation and background that you need to kind of get into this. You need calculus and some other things. And if you find interest in it, please reach out to me. I'll get you pointed in a good direction. You're going to need to spend a fair amount of time and maybe years dedicating yourself to this kind of a pursuit, though, because it is very technical. Um, it's where it's where geeks like me really geek out. And uh, we love it when people come in and try to geek out on this kind of stuff with us. It's, it's really cool stuff. But um, but it has a nice place here and has a nice place in business in general. And I hope you enjoyed it. Hope this uh, little mini lecture was uh, exciting. I hope you're excited as, uh, as I am about the possibilities of individual treatment effects. And also hope that you just in general now appreciate the difference and the hazards of just looking at correlations and thinking that they're causations. With that said, I hope you also appreciate that correlations can get you a lot of insight and they are not worthless by any means. There's a whole place in the world for correlation. It doesn't mean causation's everything. Causation's costly. Causation takes a lot of effort. Causation takes a lot of, of, in my case, good quality data. And so that costs money. And so, you know, and you don't always need it. You know, you don't always need to break out the surgical tool to, you know, to take the Ziploc off of your loaf of bread. You just don't need it all the time. You don't need to go into surgery for that. So uh, it just depends. And sometimes actually it's not as hard as it is. It depends on what you got there. So sometimes I say surgery say, sounds complicated. Sometimes it's not actually that hard. Depends. But um, anyway, we could talk. I'll talk, 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 talk for years if I keep going. So I'm going to end it here. Please reach out. If you have any questions, comments, love to hear them. And uh, best of luck to all of you going forward. Please also reach out to me if you want to, if you have anything that you want to have me look at, my questions. I'm happy to take a look at that. As far as like real applications, I'm happy to look at it.